There have been more protests in Europe about genetically modified foods. Seed grown in the United States has been the focus of Greenpeace attention in Germany, Holland and Britain. A truckload of... It seems like every week there's a news story about genetics. People are worried about eating genetically modified foods, about human cloning, about moving genes across species, about having DNA data used against them, about genetically engineered biological weapons. On the other hand, we see stories of medical miracles, of the preservation of endangered species, of modified organisms saving the environment, of new and better products, of crimes solved by DNA fingerprinting. People like these things because they see them improving their lives. So why can't we keep the genetics we like and stop the genetics we don't like? Why? Well, for a start, it's the same genetics. Like a coin, genetic technology has two sides, depending on how it's used. Take DNA profiling, for example. Profiling our so-called junk DNA gives us DNA fingerprinting. As a law and order tool, it's very powerful and helpful in solving crime. In a parallel way, profiling our working genes has given us an insight into a number of diseases that were hitherto a mystery. It promises some revolutionary cures. But DNA profiling has another edge as well. Would you want to suddenly find out that you have a genetic disease? How would that make you feel? Huntington disease, a case in point, is quite precisely defined in the genes. Others are not. What if the prediction proved wrong? It's easy to see how DNA testing is a very sensitive issue. Used insensitively, it could stratify society. Unfortunately, you have tested as unsuitable, and your application is rejected. We regret that a home loan over more than 10 years will not be available. Based on your DNA profile, your life insurance fee... Well, actually, life insurance have had a long-standing interest in genetics, albeit to date, our interest in your chance of getting an inherited disease has usually taken the form of asking you your family's medical history. And so, really, in effect, the price you pay today for insurance already reflects your genetic makeup. Whether that will change in the future, probably not for a very, very long time. And that's because most common diseases are in fact not a single gene malfunction, but many multiples of genes acting in concert with the environment. And so DNA tests will be more like a cholesterol test. No guarantee you'll die of a particular disease, but more an increased probability that you might acquire that disease. Another example of genetics cutting two ways is gene therapy. Gene therapy is the application of recombinant DNA to medicine. In other words, it's the replacement of a faulty gene to cure a disease. Already, its application in muscular dystrophy and cystic fibrosis is working. These are diseases which have defied medical science until now. Its big target is, of course, cancer. Gene therapy, however, falls into two types. One is called somatic therapy, which means therapy on body cells. In somatic therapy, the recombinant genes are infused into grown body cells. They do not go into the germ cells, that is, into sperm or eggs. They cannot be passed on to children which is the other type of therapy, germline therapy. This means inserting the new gene into a germ cell so that as multiple division occurs and a new individual develops, the new gene copies, along with its host DNA, into every cell in the body. It produces a genetically modified organism that can pass the gene onto its offspring. Many people see germline therapy as totally unacceptable. This, they say, is where we're playing God, tampering with human destiny. 
At least the somatic patient has a choice in what is being done. An egg does not. Many governments, including Australia, have indicated their disapproval of germline therapy. But, interestingly, most have stopped short of actually banning it in law. Why? Probably because there are two sides to even this. While many think it wrong, germline therapy could bring benefits to our species. What about genes to resist various diseases? Future generations could be immune, and those diseases might even die out. Would a ban be effective anyway? Research might just move offshore. Since biotechnology costs plenty, it tends to be in the hands of multinational corporations. And there are customers waiting, people who would like to give their children a genetic advantage. Disease resistance is one thing. What about higher intelligence, a better physique, longer life? Money is waiting to be made. History warns us where ideas about breeding a better human race can lead. In the 1930s and 40s, Hitler and the Nazis defined Jews, gypsies, as genetically inferior and a risk to the racial health of Nazi Germany. As we know, this led to the Holocaust, the systematic annihilation of six million Jews. Of course, genetics holds promise for legitimate healthcare users, but there must be proper safeguards to ensure that genetic technology won't be used by political movements for racist ends. Genetic technology isn't good enough yet to do these things, but it may well be in the future. And so to a second reason why it's hard to discriminate between genetic applications. They are shades of grey. For example, if it is an ethical problem to do germline therapy on people, then perhaps it's okay to do it on animals. From farm animals to pets, we've been manipulating genes for years. Plants too. In fact, from dog lovers to rose breeders, we've taken a delight in modifying the genotypes of various species to bring forth the phenotypes of our desires. Of course, these organisms have been modified by breeding, not direct genetic engineering. But there's no doubt that these phenotypes would not have arisen without human interference. In fact, it's hard to avoid it. After all, from the moment you fence in your animals or plants, you've altered their environment and their gene pool. Inbreeding will happen. We direct it, that's all. But it's not all with biotechnology. Now, for the first time, we can take genes from any life form and transplant them into any other. No breeder can do that. Yet the aim is the same as it always was, to create a more useful organism. It's all the same genetic code. So where do you draw the line? Species swaps? Phylum swaps? What about kingdom swaps? Putting human genes into bacteria to make much needed drugs was hailed as a medical breakthrough. Preparing baboons as possible organ donors raised a lot of objections. Researchers fell back on pigs instead. We eat pigs so maybe that's okay. This is one kind of grey area where emotions run high. Another is the way a discovery made for medical reasons, and maybe even publicly funded, also may be applied in the marketplace. Growth hormone therapy was developed to help hormone deficient children, but soon attracted parents simply wanting to make their normal kids taller. Therapy to give cancer kids their hair back could also have a huge market with balding men. A gene to help arthritis could benefit athletes. There are many examples suggesting that, as with today's plastic surgery, genetics may become a province of the wealthy, who may buy genes to be taller, more intelligent, good-looking and longer lived than the rest of us. Right now, user pays genetics is mostly future fiction, but it could happen. Like in vitro fertilization, it may just become slowly more available 
and finally be accepted as a fact of life. What happens will depend largely on money, and money is a genetic issue itself. While some research attracts federal funding, much more takes place in the laboratories of private corporations. These companies have to make a living by selling products, so they look to patent their discoveries. As research therefore moves into the private sector, scientists are less free to share their knowledge. The patenting of knowledge, because of money, is another genetics issue. Traditionally, scientists have been used to sharing the results of their experiments and innovation with their colleagues. However, today in our brave new world of genetic research, this is not always the case. The reason companies and institutions wish to patent their innovations. Now, the purpose of patenting is to provide legal protection and it enables one to get a research and investment return. There are some downsides. Clearly, researchers no longer are as eager to share their results until the patent issues, and they don't present papers at scientific conferences, in fact, until the patent is out. But there's some very real pluses. Firstly, it has led to far more dollars being invested in genetic research. Secondly, it's led to an increased rate of gain in new discoveries and innovations. And thirdly, very importantly, it's created a lot of new jobs in the genetic industry. So, as you can see, there are both advantages and disadvantages to patenting, but one thing is absolutely certain, it has led to a far greater rate of gain in genetic discovery than we've ever seen before. Money and the desire to make it leads into the fourth issue of genetics, the possibility of mistakes. The need to get products out there has seen mistakes, from the redder tomato, which was withdrawn because it bruised too easily, to starlink corn, which was supposed to have been used only in animal feed, but got into the human supply. So far, any harm has been limited, but questions about the potential for harm dominate the debate. The problem is that we don't really know the full consequences of our actions until we see them played out. So the answers to such questions as will transgenic organisms be harmful, are GM foods safe to eat, how will genetic engineering affect me, cannot be fully known, except in time. The fear is that mistakes or unknown factors may show up as the need to make a profit hurries the science along. This whole debate is not helped by the media either, which tends to go for sensationalism. Take TV, for example. Stories on genetics often have the flavour of, wow, isn't that fantastic, or uh, fear, what's going to happen tomorrow? But even those of us who would rather see information than emotion when we make television, we find it difficult, because TV lends itself to showmanship, not to details. And since a lot of people get their information from the media, that means that there's a lot of attitudes out there about genetic issues which are not well informed. Yet what is information? Is it labels on cans of genetically modified food? What does that really tell a consumer? What we really need to know is often not known by anybody. Genetics is a scientific revolution happening now. For the most part, so far, so good. But since its potential is so powerful, we should be as cautious and vigilant as possible. Everyone should want to know what's happening in genetics. <laughs>